This JBIC presentation concerns the actions of the prosecution witness, Robert Beauflower. Robert Beauflower intended to disinherit Jeremy Bamber from his grandmother's estate. And Robert made contributions of deceitful evidence to the police, suggesting that Jeremy Bamber committed the murders. Also raised are the lies he told to the jury and the damning evidence of the blood in the sound moderator, all created by Robert Beauflower. These acts were committed in order to steal money from the estate of the Bamba family, disinherit Jeremy, and to ensure the conviction of innocent Jeremy Bamba. The following presentation relies wholly on evidence from case papers released to the defence in 2011, and the bulk of the information comes from statements, note cards and diaries, which the relatives or beneficiaries themselves kept as evidence and passed to the police to use in court if they saw fit. Robert Beauflower was Jeremy's uncle through his marriage to Pamela, who was the sister of Jeremy's mother, June. David, born in October 1947, and two years later, they had Christine Anne, now known as Anne Eaton. Approximately six months after their wedding in 1947, Robert was given the tenancy of the farm in which he lived, known as Carbonells. The farm and the land connected to the farm which he worked was owned by June and Pamela's mother, Jeremy's grandmother, Mabel Speakman. Robert Beauflower paid a nominal rent of one pound a year to Mabel. In one of the many lies Robert Beauflower was responsible for, he told the police in statements that he owned the farm. However, Anne Eaton later admitted in her evidence that it was in fact rented. During a 28-day time period, between from the 7th of August and 6th of September 1985, Jeremy's relatives were in some form of contact with the police on a daily basis. In fact, it may surprise you to know that no fewer than 67 occasions are documented within this time frame. During the majority of these visits to the police station or in telephone calls, Robert in particular, but also Anne, made increased and repeated attempts to influence the police investigations. On a large number of occasions, Robert contacted the police and more often than not spoke to DC Michael Barlow in an attempt to repeatedly press the police into investigating his own personal fictions and scenarios of what had happened on the night of the killings. He used every means possible to point the finger of suspicion at Jeremy, and this included suggesting to Essex Police a multitude of theories, and Essex Police willingly and almost immediately went along with them all. They investigated every single issue he raised and even undertook numerous unnecessary, expensive forensic examinations of articles simply because Robert requested them based on his fanciful scenarios. The beneficiaries carried out relentless daily bombardment of Essex police and the evidence they obtained was either manufactured or obtained by them to incriminate Jeremy. For example, evidence regarding the silencer, windows, scratch marks or blood and paint. These weren't just the only source of questionable evidence but it appears that on multiple instances they also adapted their evidence to assist the police and prosecution changing and enhancing what they originally said as the case progressed. Jeremy's grandmother Mabel Speakman was 95 at the time of the tragedies, but the news of the shootings was deliberately kept from her until the 28th of August 1985. Anne admitted that Mabel was only told that June, Neville, Sheila and the boys had died. Jeremy was never talked about in front of his grandmother and photographs of him 
were removed from Mabel's bedroom. Jeremy went to see his grandmother several times after the tragedies, but was always denied access, and the relative said she was too ill to see him. We don't have to take Jeremy's word for this, as Colin Caffell also stated he was refused access. Documents reveal that the manipulation of the facts probably led Mabel into the false belief that Jeremy had also died. Mabel's will had an in-issue clause, which meant that if anything happened to June or Pamela, their share of Mabel's estate would then be automatically paid to their children. As Sheila had also died, this meant that Jeremy would receive all of his mother's share of Mabel's estate. Robert couldn't allow adopted Jeremy, or the cuckoo as he called him, to inherit what he considered to be Speakman wealth, land and properties. It's important to remember that Jeremy would have been half owner of the farm and land that Robert Beauflower farmed. And so, on the 24th of August 1985, before Jeremy was even a suspect, Robert visited his solicitor, Mr Rant, to see how to have Mabel's will changed and the in-issue clause removed. Robert stated in his diary, Visited Rant to get legal position established regarding possibly profiting from his act and legal way to prevent clauses in issue in will. On the 2nd of September, almost a week before Jeremy's arrest, a new will was created, which left Mabel's entire estate to her daughter, Pamela. Remember that Mabel was deceived into thinking that Jeremy was dead, and had he been, there's no reason for the original will to have been changed. But Robert deceived Mabel, telling her it had to be done. Robert made himself executor of Mabel's will. Basil Cock, the executor of Neville, June and Sheila's estates, decided that June's mother, Mabel Speakman, would directly inherit their entire estates. The estates of Neville and June were inherited by Mabel prior to her death, during the time Jeremy was on remand before the trial. Mabel herself died on the 10th of February 1986 and probate was granted on the 3rd of July 1986. Therefore, prior to the trial, Pamela Beauflower had benefited from all three estates. On the 6th of September, DCI Ainsley visited Robert to advise him that he was taking over the investigation. And during the remainder of that day, Robert Beauflower proceeded to compile three versions of a diary. He would then hand them to DCI Ainsley. Only one of these was provided to the defence and the court. Interestingly, the disclosed version contained no information regarding Mabel's will and Robert's involvement in disinheriting Jeremy. The other versions of the diaries were not disclosed until after the trial, and therefore the jury did not hear about the change of the will. In one version, Robert thought it necessary to give his version of events that he believed happened at White House Farm and how Jeremy was, in his opinion, the perpetrator. This is what Robert Beauflower wrote and bear in mind that he refers to is Jeremy. Entry could have easily been obtained by a spare key. He could easily have persuaded his unsuspecting father to come down to open the door. Either way, he confronts Neville with a rifle properly silenced in the kitchen. Neville dies after a struggle, whilst the gun gets pushed out of the way. It hits the fireplace mantle and is ingrained with red paint. A few random shots have to be made to make it look like the work of a maniac. The magazine is emptied. It is reloaded or replaced by the spare magazine already loaded by Sheila. He mounts the stairs, enters June's bedroom. June is awake and is more difficult to kill cleanly. Another magazine full is expended on her. He reloads the magazine himself now because it is difficult to believe that he would have needed more than 20 rounds to complete the dirty work. These are the rounds that must have Sheila's fingerprints on if she did it. 
Jeremy would leave no prints because he is wearing gloves all the time. The twins are dismissed by a shot to the temple as they sleep, possibly another one each, just to make sure. Downstairs to the lounge where there is a light, remove the silencer from the gun, back upstairs to Shulia's room. She is in a deep sleep occasioned by the sleeping draught prescribed by her doctor. Wake up, Sheila. Mummy wants you to say prayers with her. Bring your Bible. Give me your arm. I'll help you. When in the mother's bedroom, lie down here, darling. Put the Bible on your chest. The Bible is placed on her chest. Give me your hand, Sheila, darling. The gun has been rested on the Bible. The hands are taken. The left hand is placed on the end of the barrel under the chin as the right hand is placed on the trigger guard and the thumb pressed onto the trigger. Bang! Sheila has committed suicide. Into Sheila's room, remove a tampax from her toilet bag. Downstairs to the lounge, a toy gun is just the thing for removing the absorbent tissue from the cardboard cylinder. The sanitary towel is used to clean the silencer that is placed in the gun cupboard. The use of socks in the place of shoes enables an exit via the window over the kitchen sink. Any trace is being removed before the window is carefully closed so that the catch falls into place so that it looks as though it had never been opened and is still incapable of being opened from the outside. Mother's bicycle could now be used to make a hasty retreat back to Goldhanger via the farm tracks that pass no dwellings, all gravelled with the exception of a few hundred yards across a rape field already combined. There is a good moon at that time of the night, so the lights would be unnecessary. The fact that he claimed to have gone windsurfing on the following weekend at Eastbourne makes me suspect that he could have been wearing a wetsuit whilst in the house, which had to be cleaned or changed before the police became suspicious. It would be reasonable to suppose that this would have been replaced by a tracksuit whilst journeying to and from the White House. Distressing, fanciful, untruthful, and the work of an overactive imagination, and nothing in it honest. The final line of this diary is revealing, as it is exactly what Robert Beauflower appeared to hope would happen with his unrelentless persistence at contacting and badgering Essex police. And Jeremy's so-called uncle insisted that the police conduct unnecessary and costly forensic examinations. So, in the first instance, it was Robert who put ideas into the heads of the police and the evidence now indicates that he and or his daughter, Anne, conspired with Julie Mugford to create such similar, yet supposedly independent accounts. They said they didn't talk to each other. However, recently uncovered evidence confirms not only did they have discussions about the case against Jeremy, and these conversations happened in the presence of DS Stan Jones. Anne, Robert and Julie each included in evidence about the sum of £2,000. The stories about the Bible being on Sheila's chest were identical. They told the police that Jeremy could have used June's bicycle as a means of escape. All spoke about the kitchen window, Jeremy dyeing his hair black, the family inheritance and many more instances too frequent and too similar to be coincidence. Robert pushed things even further and went hunting for any tyre tracks in the fields between White House Farm and Goldhanger, drawing maps of the routes he'd explored, which he provided to the police. He insisted that forensic tests were conducted for any mud on the wheels to see if it matched any of the mud between the farm and Jeremy's home. The police did this and nothing was discovered. And he demanded a silencer be tested for fibres because, he claimed, an unused tampon found in the lounge of the farm would contain vital forensic evidence. Dutifully, Essex police complied, wasting hundreds of pounds on irrelevant and futile forensic examinations. He also conducted many experiments on the kitchen window with Anne, convincing PC Barlow to climb in and out of the windows of course, this was done off the record as admitted to during the 2001 Stokenchurch investigation. Barlow confessed that as a result of this unauthorised experiment, he got a real dressing down from his superiors. Robert's imagination was in fine form when he insisted Jeremy had worn a wetsuit during the incident to prevent any visible injuries 
and to protect his clothes from being contaminated with blood. Robert thought he was really onto something with this and he confidently assured the police that the only reason Jeremy had gone to Eastbourne the following weekend was to go in the sea so that the salt in the seawater could clean off any traces of blood from the wetsuit. Yes, it's true that Jeremy went to Eastbourne with Julie and friends Andy and Karen Bishop, but at their invitation. The wetsuit was subsequently seized and examined by the police. And not surprisingly, nothing was found on it of any forensic value. Certainly no blood evidence was found using techniques including the use of luminol. All tests came back with a negative result. Bofla paid for private detectives to investigate Brett Collins and also arranged for Jeremy to be followed. He arranged for Jim Carr, the manager of the caravan site, to persuade his son Robbie, a serving Metropolitan Police officer, to follow Jeremy and report any suspicious activity to his father or Robert. P.S. Robert Carr carried out these investigations during police time, even having other officers on the force assist with this unauthorised surveillance. And of course, there was no suspicious activity to report. Not only did Robert have Jeremy spied upon, but the evidence shows that he paid £500, that's over £1,500, in today's money for background checks to be done on Jeremy's friend Brett Collins. According to Robert, this was also arranged by Jim and Robbie Carr at his request. Robert also told the police and the jury that Jeremy did not get along with his parents. Conveniently, though, he was the only witness that heard Jeremy say during a meeting at the caravan site that he could easily kill his parents. Essex police, of course, jumped on this, but discovered this conversation never happened, as is confirmed in Essex Police Action Number 381, dated the 19th of the 9th, 1985, that requested Pamela should be asked about this incident of threats to kill by Jeremy Bamber during meeting at Ozy Caravan site. At 5.40pm that same day, DC Hood interviewed Pamela and recorded the results on the action, stating that Pamela Beauflair interviewed does not recall the conversation. She was not told of the conversation by her husband, and further, a negative statement is attached. We'll come back to what the jury thought shortly. DCI Ainsley felt the need to join in with the assassination of Jeremy's character and expressed, I feel at this stage it should be said very few people have good words to say for Jeremy. However, what Ainsley didn't want the DPP to know, that in fact many people had spoken highly of him. And it is therefore of great importance to bring your attention that many witness statements written by friends of Jeremy have never been disclosed to the defence and still remain secret. Analysis of the Holmes Computer System indexes revealed that there are a total of at least 14 witness statements given in evidence by friends of Jeremy. The vast majority of these remain hidden to this day. Firstly, a reminder that Robert Beauflower was a thief. He had no conscience about taking the contents from Neville's wallet and pocketing the £400 it contained there three days after his death. Robert became increasingly preoccupied with Jeremy and the family treasures, as he referred to the contents of the farmhouse. Mr Cock, the executor, gave Jeremy permission to sell some of the smaller items of bric-a-brac and treasures. No doubt, Robert was annoyed he'd not cleared these out of the house on the first sweep with Anne. Robert's agitation was clear in his evidence when he wrote phrases such as Jeremy is selling uh, cars and uh, removing treasures from the White House. Met Jeremy loading family treasures into car for Sotheby's to clean catalogue and value before sale. Met Jeremy loading treasures into the farm Sherpa blue van. Asked Jim to get Robbie to arrange for Sheila's flat to be watched and Jeremy's friend Red or anything else suspicious. Arrange 
through friends in London for Jeremy to be watched. 6pm, Jim came in to say that Robbie had seen the police re Sheila's flat. And at 3.40pm, Jay's car was seen parked at the rear and a man with fair hair, stocky, possibly parted in the middle, wearing blue-black and re-jumper and beige trousers, load furniture out of Sheila's flat. I rang with him, asked Jones to ring me back. At the trial, the jury would not told that Robert Beauflower's blood group was an exact match for Sheila's. The judge even expressed in his summing up, time and again, the blood sourced from Sheila only. As you may know, in 2002, the appeal was granted on the issue DNA testing had found that Sheila's DNA was not in the silencer. But that of an unknown male was. Can you guess who was never asked to give a DNA sample for elimination purposes? Yes, Robert Beauflower. Another major issue at the trial concerned the jury who raised a question with the judge questioning Robert Beauflower's credibility and his motive. The jury asked, if Jeremy Bamba was found guilty and imprisoned for many years, who would be the beneficiaries of the Bamba estates and monies? Could it be his uncle and family? A possible reason or motive for Robert Beauflower's statement about Jeremy being able to kill his own parents? Robert Beauflower made a statement in response to this in which he stated under oath, Sometime in October 1985, I sought professional advice on the possible beneficiary of the Bamber estate in the event of Jeremy being unable to inherit. There's no reference anywhere in case documentation that Robert sought this advice during October 1985, the only documented time that Robert saw his solicitor regarding any aspect of the estates was on the 24th of August, when he pursued information from Mr Rant as detailed above. This appears to have been a deliberate act of deception. He goes on to state, Personally, I would have no claim on the estate and would not benefit in any way. Although the first part of this sentence is correct, and he would have no personal claim, he would benefit via his wife, as we've already detailed. Perhaps the most significant lie Robert gave in evidence on his statement was the most relevant. My estate is now approximately £300,000, as is my wife's. My estate includes a freehold farm in partnership with my wife, a farming partnership with my son, stocks and shares, family heirlooms, fishing rights in Scotland and pensions plus insurance policies. My estate, as he referred to it, was only worth this considerable amount as he had inherited directly through Pamela's inheritance of the Speakman and Bamber estates pre-trial. Prior to this, neither Robert nor Pamela had these assets as they had come solely from the estate of Mabel, which following the tragedies had recently incorporated the Bamber estate as well. In direct response to the question, Robert also stated, I've been taught to count my wealth in health and friends, not in LSD. However, had the jury been told the complete scale of the value of the estates and being informed Mabel's will was changed at the insistence of Robert, then it may have given them even greater concern about the evidence he provided as a key prosecution witness. At trial, Prosecution Counsel Mr Arledge raised the issue that Robert Beauflower had not been asked directly if he was lying about his position in respect of what he would or wouldn't inherit. I think a question should have been put, have you lied so that your family can inherit from the estate? This was overruled by the judge and the question was not asked, despite Arledge's doubt. The full extent of the assets and land and properties was never disclosed to the jury. These assets are either described in case documentation, wills of the deceased, documents from company's house and the land registry and from information from Jerry Bamba. 
The assets consisted of White House Farm and Land Tenancy, the business NNJ Bamba Limited, documented evidence reveals that Peter Eaton, who was put in charge of the business and farm, was reported as stealing from the business and also ran it into the ground within four months. Peter Eaton was reported to the fraud squad to investigate. However, nothing was done regarding these criminal allegations. Ozy Road Caravan Site Additional field next to the caravan park owned exclusively by June Bamba Oak and Pylon Fields owned by June, Neville and Jeremy Charity Farm, 50 acres of land bought by June and Neville Hyams Farm, which June owned a 3 16th share of the land and house 50 acres of land between Little Totten and Tolstant Major, which was the land Neville bought for Anne and Peter. Nine Head Street Goldhanger, Jeremy's Cottage, purchased for £10,000 by Neville in June, which sold in 2013 for £295,000. Sheila's apartment, Moore's Head Mansions, made of ale, London, was purchased of £34,000 and achieved a sales figure of £700,000 in 2016. Vaulty Manor Farm, tenanted by Mabel Speakman and the land farmed by Neville prior to the tragedies. Carbonell's Farm, with Burnt Ash Farmhouse and land, Mabel Speakman owned these farms which Robert and Pamela Bowflower rented. They lived in Carbonell's farmhouse. David lived at Burnt Ash Farm. Gardener's Farm land. In 1985, Neville Bamber farmed this land, which would later be farmed by Anne and Peter Eaton, who also purchased it. Clifton House Apartments, Guildford. The magnificent manor house owned by Neville Bamber's parents, Beatrice and Herbert which were left in equal shares upon their death to Neville Bamba, Anthony Pargeter and his sister Jacqueline Wood and were converted to flats. In 1985, the value of Neville's interest was 62720 By the year 2000, the flats had sold for an estimated total of 951000 Neville owned 50 acres of land at Little Renters Farm. Monies due from the estate of Beatrice Bamba. Loans were made by the late Beatrice, totalling 61,152, which was outstanding on the estate. This figure would have been Neville's share of the owed funds. Shares in North Malden Growers. Neville owned shares in a business he helped to establish called North. Molden Growers. Cash and money in bank accounts. June and Neville held several bank accounts at the time of their deaths. June Bamber's accounts totaled 30,333 and Neville Bamber's 1,400. Life insurance policy. At the time of her death, June Bamber had an insurance policy with a value of 9,806. Personal chapels, jewellery, vehicles, artwork. Neville and June owned many personal chattels, including pieces of art, vehicles, and items of jewellery, which at the time of their deaths, Neville Bamber's share totaled 20,000 and June's share was £10,000. Debenture shares in Tesco stores purchased in 1957. Mabel Speakman owned £10,000 worth of shares for Tesco stores in 1985, which made up part of her estate. Had the jury been given an honest answer about who would inherit upon Jeremy's conviction, and had they known that Robert's blood group was an exact match for Sheila, would they have viewed his testimony against Jeremy as unmotivated? Even after the trial, Robert Bayflower impacted on Jeremy's case. On the 27th of June 1991, as a result of a review about his status, Jeremy was downgraded to Category B. This is discussed in a letter dated the 16th of September 1991, which states, 
The committee noted that the offences had been narrowly targeted and there was no sign of mental illness or further evidence from prison after six years in custody to suggest that Bamba would be a danger to the public at large. The governor and wing governor recommended Bamba's downgrading in view of his cooperative attitude, good behaviour and it is suggested that he does not rank with other mainstream cates. Prior to this decision, Anne Eaton, David Bowflow and Robert Bowflow had all informed the City of London Police that they had considered that they were in danger should Jeremy be released. However, the Home Office didn't agree and proceeded with the downgrade. Something actually went in the right direction for Jeremy for once, but this wasn't to last. On the 12th of September 1991, an article was published in the News of the World, giving details of how Jeremy was not considered to be a danger to the public and that his category had been downgraded. Robert Beauflower immediately complained to the Home Office and Jeremy was upgraded back to Category A again by the 30th of July 1992. Jeremy has remained a Category A prisoner ever since. Jeremy is supposedly a whole life tariff prisoner. And it is because of this his security status remains unchanged. However, Jeremy is not a whole life tariff prisoner. He had a parole hearing scheduled for 2002 and has had hearings every five years since. And this will be discussed in detail in a future presentation. Robert Beauflin died on the 11th of July 2010, aged 92 having suffered with Alzheimer's and spent some time in a nursing home before his death. Robert Beauflower was instrumental in assisting the police and inventing whatever evidence he needed to ensure Jeremy's conviction. He disinherited Jeremy by instigating changes to Jeremy's grandmother's will. Robert also willingly and frequently lied under oath in order to be sure Jeremy was convicted. The jury were right to have their suspicions, and had they known about this evidence, their decision might very well have been different. <laughs> <laughs>